Today's scripture reading is from John 18, 20 through 40, which is page 766 in the Pew Bible. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Ephesus to the place of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not want to enter the place because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, he would not have handed them over to you. Pilate said, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? I am a Jew, Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered there, and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in the uprising. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this time together. God, we thank you that we don't have to question what is true, but God, you define truth for us and you are happy to reveal it to us. So God, I pray that anything that might be distracting us today will be cast to the side so that we may focus on you, that we may hear your voice, and that the truth of what you say will cut deep into our souls and spirits and bring us life and hope. Amen. Is anything better than a good mystery. I can remember as little as like four years old being obsessed with mysteries and finding clues. And you want to know where it all began? It began in pre-K with Blue's Clues. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with the show or you have a little kid at home who likes it, but I loved yelling at the TV. You know, Steve is on the, the screen and I love to be like, turn around, turn around. There was a paw print, a clue behind him that I wanted him to get. So we were, you know, one step closer to figuring out what Blue's favorite story was or what she wanted for snack or whatever the very important mystery of the day was. I even declared there was a recliner in the living room at my great-grandmother's house where I would watch Blue's Clues, and the recliner was my own personal thinking chair so that I could contemplate life's greatest mysteries at four. And as I grew up, that um, attention, I maybe redirected it away from Blue's Clues, but the love for mysteries remained. Um, I remember checking out Nancy Drew with my fellow uh, girlfriends in middle school, and we would read them together and talk about, you know, who we thought did it or where the secret item was going to end up being. Eventually, I liked things like X-Files or CSI when that was really popular, and we would have watch nights with my family, and we would try to figure it out before the TV show did. There's just something satisfying about putting your heads together to figure out a good mystery. And I wonder today, I wonder what would happen if Christ's church would seek truth together more often. I wonder what that would be like. Now, hear me out. Everyday life often doesn't feel like you're loading up the mystery machine with like your favorite pup and your friends, right? That's not quite what life feels like. If anything, I would say life feels more like a game of Clue, or not Clue, sorry, a game of um, Guess Who, that's the one where you got the little board and you flip the people up and down. If you've ever played Guess Who with the wrong partner, you know it goes south really quickly. So like if I ask my sister, does your person wear glasses, and she accidentally says no when in fact they do wear glasses 
it ruins the whole game. Just throw the board out the window. And this is kind of what it feels like too often with our brothers and sisters in the faith, isn't it? It feels like we're living in two very different worlds, two very different realities of what truth is and what the rules of life are. And it just seems to ruin God's very good idea that we talked about last week. In this tension, it brings us back to the heart of our current series. You see, this November in worship, our church, First Baptist, we are studying a series called One. And the whole idea of the series is a reminder that unity comes from God. Our church is meditating on where unity comes from, what it looks like for our church and in the world as we strive to be united. So last week was our first week of the series, and we remembered together that we are united under the one authority of Jesus Christ. That God is the source of all unity, and it's only from being firmly rooted in him that any of us remain connected to one another, right? And today we're going to build on that foundation. Today we're going to keep going and look into more of the details, the nitty-gritty of how this unity plays out. And the mystery that emerges for us this morning is this. How does unity actually play out when we have so many different ideas of truth surrounding us? And the answer that I hope we see is that we are united by our shared pursuit of one truth which is revealed in Jesus Christ. We are united by our shared pursuit of one truth which is revealed in Jesus Christ. So let's keep diving into this mystery. What is truth and who gets to decide the truth? These aren't new questions. These questions are at the heart of everything happening in John 18. So if you haven't already, this is your moment. Grab your Bibles, turn to John chapter 18. That's where we're going to be this morning. There is a pew Bible in front of you if you would like to use one. And for anyone who's new here, we believe at First Baptist that the Bible is God's gift to us. We believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, and it reveals to us who God is, what God has done, and how we get to respond to God's goodness in this world. The Old Testament is all about God's relationship with Israel, and then the New Testament continues that story, and it talks about God's relationship with all of the world through Jesus Christ in the beginning of the early church. So John chapter 18, we're going to begin in verse 28. We're beginning our search for truth. Verse 28 says, and you can read it with me. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas and to the place, or sorry, to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. Verse 28 is a transitional statement. It's setting up the case at hand that we're looking at. And to set the backstory for our mystery this morning, John is a book in the New Testament, and it tells us about Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. So last week, we were talking about, excuse me, Jesus' prayer in John 17, just one chapter earlier, right? Last week, we saw how Jesus was showing his authority, and he was praying that God would reveal this authority to the disciples. Some of you might remember the block illusion that we had, or illustration, rather. And that brings us to John 18. You see, right after Jesus finishes praying with the disciples, and he had that, like, whole just-you-wait conversation, John 18, the waiting has come. The bad he was talking about and saying to wait for, it has come. Jesus has been betrayed. He is now being arrested. The disciples are scattered. Uh, Peter has already started to deny that he ever knew Jesus. Things are not great in chapter 18. All right? And meanwhile, while all the disciples are scattered and pretending like they didn't know Jesus, Jesus ends up, after his arrest, going to the high priest, Caiaphas, where he's questioned. He's questioned about his teachings. He's questioned about who he is. And Jesus is just honest with the high priest. He's like, I have told you the truth. I've told you this over and over again about who I am. I'm not trying to be sneaky here. And the priest He really didn't like that answer, so much so he had one of his men basically slap Jesus for it. But also, all the truth that Jesus had said about who he was, it wasn't really enough for the high priest to do anything. And so, all he can do is pass Jesus along to a Roman official and hope that the Roman official 
we'll get rid of Jesus and the priest won't have to worry about it anymore. That's their plan. So that is what verse 28 is helping us do. It's helping us get to speed on the situation, that the high priest can't quite finish the, the job when they want to get rid of Jesus, and so they send him off to Pilate. And that's where we're really studying our case for truth this morning, is Jesus and Pilate in this trial. So let's keep reading, picking up in verse 29. So Pilate comes out, and he's talking to the Jewish leaders. Pilate came out to them, and he asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he weren't a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we don't have any right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. The first witnesses we have in our mystery for truth are the Jewish leaders, and they are a sneaky group of people. Have you ever tried to get someone in trouble? Perhaps maybe when you were younger, you don't have to admit to it now, but if you have a sibling, maybe, you don't even have to admit it, but maybe you tried to get them in trouble once or twice. I'm, I'm seeing some potential nods maybe from a couple of you students. And there's a balance, right? There's a balance if you want to get someone in trouble, right? Because on one hand, nobody likes a tattletale, right? Think about when you were in school. If, if a tattletale goes up to a teacher and they're like, teacher, teacher, so-and-so is staring at me weird. Your teacher does not care. Your teacher's like, then don't look at him, right? <laughs> that solves that problem. Nobody likes a tattletale. The kid who is staring at you weird, he doesn't get in trouble because you're just a tattle. But then you've got the other hand, right? Nobody likes someone who takes justice into their own hands, right? So this is the flip side. Two kids run up to the teacher. One of them's crying, and they're like, teacher, teacher, so-and-so hit me. And then so-and-so is like, well, you hit me first. But who gets in trouble? The kid who hit second, because they should have come and told the teacher instead of getting revenge right? So there, there are rules. I didn't make up the rules, but you know I'm right. You've lived this. There are rules if you're going to get someone in trouble. And this is basically what's playing out here with these Jewish leaders, all right? The Jewish leaders know they don't have enough to kill Jesus themselves, which is why they brought Jesus to Pilate. And they know that they can't say too much or too little because they'll either come off as a tattletale who just has a Jewish problem that Pilate won't care about, or um, if they try to kill him without Pilate, then, as they say, they don't have the right to do that. They can't execute Jesus themselves. They need someone else to do their dirty work. So that's what the Jewish leaders are trying to do. They're trying to walk this fine line of getting Jesus into trouble. And Pilate he really doesn't want to play this game. He tries his best to get out of this. He even tries to tell the Jewish leaders, you do you. Just go take care of it. It just doesn't work. He's stu Pilate is stuck with Jesus one way or the other. And so he has to question him, and he has to pursue what is in front of him. Let's keep going. John, 30, or John 18, 33 through 37. Our, fir our first witness, the Jewish leaders, they're unhelpful in pointing us any closer to the one truth. And Pilate, he's going to be questioning Jesus, Jesus as his next witness in this pursuit of truth. Verse 33 reads, Pilate then went back inside the palace. He summoned Jesus and he asked him, are you king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asks. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, Pilate said. Given the circumstances, I honestly can't decide if Jesus is bold, hilarious, 
or both. Did you catch how kind of snippy Jesus is? When Pilate asked Jesus if he is king of the Jews, Jesus doesn't actually answer his question originally. He almost insults him. He's like, is that your idea, Pilate, or did someone else have to tell you that? Do you know that I'm the king, or did someone else have to tell you that to figure it out? It's a little funny. (laughs) Pilate controls the outcome of Jesus' life or death, and Jesus does not care. I mean, I wouldn't be that bold. I'm the person who likes to follow the rules anyways, so there's that about me. But, like, I'm also the person who, like, if I even think I've done something wrong, I'm going to apologize, like, and apologize again and apologize again. And then I have to apologize because I'm annoying you because I've apologized too many times. But that's not what we see here. Jesus is different. Jesus, as we already know from chapter 17, he's been given all authority, even authority over Pilate. So Jesus doesn't have anything to fear. He has nothing to apologize for. Jesus came to the earth, both for the Jewish leaders who brought him to trial, and he came for Pilate, even though Pilate has no idea that God even promised a Messiah. Pilate has no idea that God even sent this Messiah for him. And so honestly, I like to think that Jesus' boldness here, he's not trying to be mean to Pilate, he's not trying to be too snippy, but he's trying to be a teacher, the good teacher, the good shepherd that he has always been. He's trying to ask the right questions to get Pilate to think about who he is and what truth is. But Pilate doesn't totally get it yet. Pilate admits he's not a Jew. And so, of course, he really doesn't know what this trial is about, aside from what the chief priests tell him. And Pilate leans in on his witness. He tries to get more direct. What has Jesus done? Verses 30, verse 36 is interesting in Jesus' answer. Jesus doesn't actually say what he has done. He tells Pilate what he hasn't done. Jesus says that he, his kingdom is not of this world, and Jesus says that his servants did not fight arrest. And this is all that Pilate needs. You are a king then. It's the aha moment Pilate feels like he's figured it out. The mystery is beginning to be solved. The pieces are beginning to click into place. You see, Jesus said he had a kingdom. And even if Jesus' kingdom is totally backwards and totally upside down and not doing the things that he would expect, it is still a kingdom nonetheless. I mean, this is like the first rule of Fight Club, right? You don't talk about Fight Club. Well, the first rule of Roman rule is you don't get to have kings, right? It's the bottom line. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace. You see, it was only possible because they allow, the Roman government, they allowed all the people that they conquered to have quite a bit of freedom, a lot more than other countries that would conquer other groups. They would allow them to keep a lot of their religions and jobs, their families, a lot of basic customs of life, as long as... They pledged loyalty to the Roman government, and they didn't have any other kings or rulers other than the Roman government, right? Oftentimes, this also came out in emperor uh, worship, right? That was part of adopting the Roman rule. And there was a very good reason for this rule in the Romans' minds, right? Because if you proclaim to have another king outside of Rome— then that implied that some large portion of your country was following this self-proclaimed king, and they would have loyalty towards that self-proclaimed king, and they might follow that king to make an army and then have an uprising and then potentially conquer the Roman Empire. And this would be a problem for them. So the number one rule, we don't have extra kings around here. This was something that Pilate knew and something Jesus knew too. Even if Jesus is a weird king by the Roman standards, and even if Jesus wasn't fighting his arrest, right? He was showing that he was being submissive, even if he didn't have to. Even if he wasn't doing an uprising, even if he wasn't a Messiah like the Jews wanted him to be, Jesus was, in fact, still king. Jesus is, in fact, still king. And Pilate knows that he's closing in on something here. He can feel that the truth is at hand. We're at the climax of the story. So 
let's get, check out the rest of it. Continuing our reading, John 18, 37 through 40. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. And with this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there, and he said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. And Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Pilate might think that he has finally caught Jesus, but Jesus is still fully in control. Jesus has been intentional with every word, and at this point in the trial, Jesus is going full-on teacher mode as, Pilate is, as if Pilate was one of his disciples. I mean, Jesus admits to being a king, even though he knows it could be his death and will be his death. And then Jesus explains why he came to be king. And again, like we talked about last week, it's not for power's sake. It's not for power of itself. But Jesus came to be king so that he could tell everyone the truth. Jesus came to be king so he could tell everyone the truth. Finally, this feels like the biggest clue we've found for this one truth that we've been seeking for. You see, truth doesn't come from philosophers in this text. It's not coming from people with great minds, though certainly those people might know how to apply truth towards ethics or practical living. In our scripture today, we see that truth isn't coming from science experiments, though science certainly helps us make sense of the truth in the physical world. And truth isn't coming from deep within. It's not coming from introspection, though certainly self-reflection can probably help us pause long enough to hear God's voice and to hear that truth. But as it turns out, according to John 18, truth isn't subjective. There's no such thing as my truth or your truth. There is one truth, and the one truth comes from this King, Jesus Christ. And this need for truth is exactly why Jesus came to the world. Jesus came to share the truth freely with anyone who would listen, even Pilate, who really doesn't want to be there to begin with. Everyone who is on the side of truth listens to Jesus. And they do that because they know that truth comes from him alone. And this is good news. But this good news is contrasted immediately. It's, it's a very sad response that Pilate has, isn't it? Pilate laughs. Psh, what is truth? He hears the truth, but he laughs at the idea. He can't imagine that a single truth might exist. What he sees in life is everyone running in their own ways, everyone deciding their own truth. The idea that there is even a side of truth to be on is shocking, and he dismisses it. It is a sad response indeed. So what does all of this mean? What does John 18 tell us about who God is? What does it tell us about our theology as the people of God? I want to remind you that our main idea for today is that we are united by our shared pursuit of one truth revealed in Jesus Christ. Christians, when it comes to living in unity within the church, we have a choice to make, right? We can choose to be like Pilate. We can choose to be like Pilate who scoffs at the notion, who cannot imagine that there is a one truth to live by. We can choose that route. But also we can choose the other route. We can choose to embrace and listen to the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the one who came to tell us the truth, who longs to give it to us like a gift, a gift that corresponds with his life. And if we're going to be the people who listen to Jesus and who are on the side of truth, it requires us to forsake our own ideas of what truth is, that we have to admit sometimes that we are wrong. But being mistaken is not something to shame, right? Who's never been wrong? I mean, I believe in this room we all know people who think they've never been wrong, right? 
maybe a time or two, I have been someone who thought I was not wrong. But I have been wrong. It is not something to be ashamed of when we are wrong. But what is to be shamed is to be like Pilate, who scoffs at truth when it is revealed to him. The real shame is choosing to listen to the lies, listen to conspiracies, or listen to anything that is dividing us in the world, instead of listening to the voice of the Good Shepherd. And I want us to be careful. We should notice that Jesus, he doesn't say that he is on the side of truth, right? When he's talking to Pilate, he doesn't say that he is king and he is on the side of truth. What he says is that anyone who is on the side of truth is with him. It's a subtle difference. Jesus isn't one to choose sides, but Jesus is the one who is defining what the sides are and who is defining where where truth stands. Jesus is the one who is drawing the line in the sand, so to say, and he is the one who is telling us what is true. So it is us It is our job as the church, as we are trying to be united and living together, it is our job to listen to him and to go onto his side, not merely just to assume Jesus is on our side. If the church has any hope of being united and being a witness to God's work in the world, then we must be more committed to discerning truth together by listening to God's word. And some of the mysteries that we need to be solved, they're going to be difficult to hear about. They're going to be hard to hear the truth. But yet we need to be submissive both to one another and ultimately to God's voice about what he says. And when we are committed to listening to God together, and when we're committed to being on the side of truth with Jesus, then we are all united as one in that pursuit. Because we are united by the shared pursuit of one truth revealed in Jesus Christ. So how then should we live? I have three application points for you to consider this morning, all right? So at first, or number one, I want you to consider that you should admit when you don't know the answer to something. Did you ever have a favorite teacher in school? One of my favorite teachers in school was Miss Colley, all right? Um, She was, somehow or another, I managed to get her in fourth grade and fifth grade. I don't know how that happened, but it was a blessing. Miss Colley was phenomenal. And of the many, many reasons that Miss Colley is my favorite teacher that I've ever had, she was always honest with us if she didn't know something. But then she would join us in the pursuit of that truth. She would join us to uh, research the answer as a class together, and usually in creative ways, right? So we might ask a silly question in history, like, what was it like for Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel? And Miss Colley would sit there and think, and she's like, you know, I wasn't there. I'm not that old, right? Um, But I wonder if we could do something that might help us figure out what it might have been like for him. And so she got out paper and paint, and we taped paper on the bottom under our desks, and we laid on our backs on the floor, and we tried to paint the Sistine Chapel on our desks upside down as if we were Michelangelo. And then we talked about it. What was it like to do that? What might he have been feeling? And I still remember that lesson years later, right? Any question was fair game to Miss Colley, and any question that she didn't know, she just said she didn't know, and then thought, together, how can we find the answer? We would experiment, we would try new things, we would, we would talk about different ideas and what worked about them or didn't work about them. We would fail together, and we would su- succeed together too. The best teachers are the ones that engage in the learning process with their students, right? This is the mark of true discipleship too, right? There's no such thing as a Christian who has arrived with all the answers, but we are all journeying together. We are all learning together. We are sharpening each other together. And this is why when you sit in Sunday school classes, life groups, when you come to all church discipleship like you will tonight, when you're at dinner with your kids and they bring up a ridiculous question about the Bible that you've never thought about, this is good. It's okay not to know the answer. We need not be intimidated by our lack of knowledge. We also need not dismiss the question. But we can admit we don't know, 
but we do know who does know, and that's Jesus. And we can run to Jesus together. We can pray to Christ together. We can open the Word together. We can talk about it together. This is part of being united. So admit when you don't know the answer. Number two, I'm going to encourage you this week, and this kind of goes hand in hand with what we just talked about, seek truth in community. Particularly, seek truth in community of the church. All right? When did you learn, or how did you learn to walk? How did you learn to ride a bike? How did you learn your ABCs? How did you learn to balance a checkbook? How did you learn to fry chicken? How have you learned anything? The answer is someone taught you. Whether it was someone who was physically right next to you in the kitchen showing you step by step and what to do, or whether you were reading a book that someone else wrote and that it was explaining the process, or if you're like me and you're watching a YouTube video on how to fix something in your house, then it's that person over the screen. Someone helps teach us things. Similarly, we don't just learn God's truth on our own. I mean, there's a certain amount of grace that God gives all of us, sure. Yes, God speaks the Holy Spirit to all of us. Yes, God's work is at power in all of us as individuals, but he also uses the people in this room. Look to your left. Look to your right. Look behind you. Look in front of you. Look in the balcony and look below. God is speaking through each one of these people, just as he is speaking to you. Perhaps we each have part of the puzzle. Perhaps we each have different things that we are struggling with and different ways we can encourage the other. We don't find truth isolated on our own little island. We find it when we are pursuing Jesus together and we are listening to how Jesus is speaking through the lives of one another. It takes the whole community of the church. We need all of you. Third and finally, and I'll go ahead and invite the praise team to come back up here. I encourage you this week to repair relationships along the way. And this is probably the hardest part about what I'm going to say. This week, something very dreadful happened to me. My dishwasher stopped working. And I know that this is a first world problem. Some of you have heard this already because I've complained about it multiple times. But in a house with two people who work full-time, a baby, and the bottles, and all the things. Your girl needs her dishwasher. (laughs) Who's got time to hand wash these things? And so, of course, I did what anyone would do. I tried to figure out the problem, realized I was way in over my head, and I called the expert in, and he does a diagnostic, and he tells me the two or three things that are wrong with it. One I suspected, one was a surprise. Doesn't matter all those details. But then he tells me it's going to be like over $300 to fix this thing. And I kind of bite my lip. And he's like, is that all right? And I'm like, I guess. But before I said it was, I definitely was thinking in my head, is it worth it to fix it? Is the repair worth it? Is the cost too high? Should I just get something new? Should I just give up on it? Friends, I wonder if we do that sometimes in our pursuit for truth. We are all human, and in the pursuit for truth, there are disagreements, there are differences of opinion, things will get said uh, incorrectly, things will be heard incorrectly. Intentional or not, feelings are often hurt. And as we come to know the truth, it, it doesn't repair it just to know what, who was right and who was wrong. Sometimes we have to do deeper work of repair along the way. And we have to decide as a church who is united under Jesus Christ and who is united in this process of one truth together, we have to be committed to one another to repair what is broken along the way and to say that the cost is high. Sometimes our pride is hurt. Sometimes other things are hurt. But the cost is worth it in our pursuit for unity, that we must repair relationships along the way. We are all united as we pursue one truth as revealed in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you um, that we can come to you with any question, that nothing is too big for our God, but you are bigger than it all, and you hold us all in your hands. God, we thank you for every single person that you've placed in this room and for other brothers and sisters at sister churches all across the area, and we thank you that you are speaking in them, to them, and through them. 
God, I pray that you will continue to unite us as one as we pursue you and the truth that you have for this body of believers and help us to do the repair along the way. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of First Baptist Church, Unsee. My name is Nina. I've been a member of First Baptist over 75 years. One of the things I love about First Baptist is the inclusion of all ages. I love worshiping with my old friends, but it's such a joy to see the children and the young people taking a part in our worship services. At First Baptist, we aim to be spirit-led people gathered to join Christ's presence in our community. If you're able to join us for worship, we would love to welcome you. We meet for worship Sundays at 1045 at 309 East Adams Street in downtown Muncie. To learn more about our church family or to support the ministry at First Baptist, please see the links and the information in the show notes or visit us online at fbcmuncie.org. May the peace of Christ be with you always.